morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Dorn. I'm the Executive Director of Research, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship at Georgian College. We're ready to get started, and I've got my gourmet coffee right here in my Rise mug, and I got my fancy microphone right here. I got my webcam right up there, and I got my green screen right here, but I'm not really using that today. And I got my VR headset right here. Oh, wait, I don't need that right now. So basically, this is a typical 2021 new reality morning. And I'm honored to be your MC for this morning's program. And I'll do my best to keep things on track and be as entertaining as I can be. Usually, the MC has some housekeeping notes to deliver. But since you're all in your houses right now, you can do your own housekeeping. First off, welcome, everyone. And I know we have many attendees from the Barry and Simcoe area, but several other from further afield, too. So welcome to to one and all. This is the fifth annual Manufacturing Innovation Summit, and this is the first time we've ever run it in a virtual format. We want to thank BDC for being our presenting sponsor. Thanks to the Regional Manufacturing Partnership that includes Simcoe County, City of Barrie, City of Aurelia, Lakehead University, and Georgian College. And if you've not heard, we've recently launched the Shifting Gears, which is a newsletter aimed at manufacturers. You can go to innovatorscentral.ca to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Ready. And I'd also like to point out there's a video to watch about the county's Industry 4.0 Automation Accelerator Program. We have an engaging program for you this morning, so we'll kick off with an opening address from Mayor Barry Jeff Lehman, followed by Dr. Mira Ray, who will speak about Georgian's Research Innovation Program and the RISE event taking place this week. And starting right after this event, in fact, is RISE. And then we have our keynote address, which comes from Pierre Clareau, who is the VP of Research and Chief Economist for BDC. We're all very excited excited about this keynote speech today. Be sure to listen closely this morning and think up all sorts of tough questions for our keynote speaker because we're going to have a Q&A right after his talk. To kick things off, we have Mayor Lehman with opening remarks. Jeff Lehman is the 46th mayor of the city of Barrie, having been reelected to a third term in 2018 with 91% of the popular vote. As the head of council, he's leading Barrie through a period of rapid change. During his first term in office, Barrie led all metropolitan areas east of Alberta in the rate of job creation. From 2014 to 2017, Lehman chaired Ontario's Big Mayor's Caucus, representing Ontario's 27 largest cities. In 2015, Barry was named the safest city in the country and was just named Canada's third most entrepreneurial city by the Financial Post. I'll hold up my little applause sign. Mayor Lehman is also founding director of Electra and the second largest community-owned utility in North America, serving more than a million customers in Southern Ontario. Welcome, Mayor Lima. Uh, good morning, everybody. I wanted to start today with a very important land acknowledgement. While our events are virtual these days, it's very important that we recognize the territories on which we are meeting. And Georgian College acknowledges that all campuses are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabeg people. The Anishinaabeg include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Georgian College is dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. It's a huge pleasure for me to give you opening remarks today at this, the fifth annual Manufacturing Innovation Summit. And we're reconvening after, of course, 2020 had to be canceled due to COVID-19. This year, the event is virtual. It's being held in connection, obviously, with Georgian's RISE series. And Notwithstanding, COVID-19 has created a host of challenges for manufacturers worldwide. It's been astonishing for me to watch the way that so many companies have pivoted to deal with not only the needs of the global pandemic, but the challenges of working in that environment. And although this is the most serious threat to public health really we've seen century, although it's changed many lives, I think it's also driven innovation at a pace we haven't seen before. And many of these changes, and I can tell you as a mayor that the ways that we've had to change delivering services and supporting people, it's changed at a pace that we really never experienced before, but it's also created changes which are sustainable, that are likely to take us well into the future. And I know manufacturers have been tested really as never before. You've had to contend with all kinds of unpredictable variables, supply chain disruption, workplace safety, unstable markets, and of course, potential illness in the workforce. And I think, you know, obviously this is a sector where working from home isn't an option. Doing what we're doing is a rarity for manufacturers. They, so many of you have to continue to run a production line despite the challenges of distancing and PPE. And even R&D teams need access to, to laboratories and equipment 
to develop new products. KPMG in their global outlook recently was looking at the threats to manufacturing and threats I think have been eclipsed in many ways by the pandemic. But when we step back and look at the bigger picture and many of the issues that will be discussed here arise, we talk about supply chain operations, territorialism is a concern that KPMG is outlined in talent. And I think here in Barrie, we're very familiar with some of these challenges. The return to territorialism is one that I wanted to mention in particular because what they mean by that is protectionism and challenges with trade. And yet we live in a world right now where crowdsourcing, where the ability to connect, where the ability to use technology to introduce new production processes that can cross boundaries, it gives us potential we've never seen before. And what a shame it would be if our trend for protection inhibited the ability to flow ideas and people and talent to where it can be used around the world. When COVID-19 first emerged, a lot of the focus of concern for global manufacturing was China, which is, of course, a quarter of world output. But after the factories there began to reopen in late February, China's exports have risen dramatically and Western makers of manufactured goods sort of shifted their attention to supply disruptions closer to home because we did see shutdowns. Uh, more than ever, I think manufacturers have had to innovate and pivot and yet uh, try and respond to these structural challenges, these four broader threats that KPMG has identified. There's no question that technology is a key piece of this, but a lot of it's cultural. And this is something that I get a chance to talk about a lot in government. The culture of innovation requires a willingness to experiment. And if I can see a bit of a positive out of COVID-19, it's given license for companies, governments, organizations in all sectors of the economy to innovate, to attempt to make change more quickly and to take greater risks. And it's been interesting to watch in my own sector as government has attempted to respond to the challenges, what I'd call, I guess, the secondary challenges of COVID, the impacts on small businesses, the impacts on vulnerable populations. And the culture that has emerged, in part because of the emergency, is one that accepts and recognizes and, in fact, is starting to celebrate the need to innovate. Across manufacturing, this is not new because this is what's driven business for years. But we can take that spirit forward, I think. And I think it's particularly important because the productivity gap, the goal of so much of Canada's economic policy, is to try and allow the increase of production, the increase of innovation through collaboration. And in this country, we're continuing to try and grow a model that includes Georgian College, academia, that includes government, and that, of course, is founded in the research and development efforts that occur within manufacturers across the country. And so I hope as you're here over the coming days as part of the Manufacturing Innovation Summit, you see that culture. I know it is embedded in the DNA of Georgian College. I know that this organization has made such efforts, including over the last very difficult year, to pivot in the world of virtual learning and connections, and yet to take that opportunity to shift the culture even further and to try and build new models of collaboration, not only because of the challenges of the pandemic, but to face those structural challenges that we all face going forward. So I very much want to welcome you on behalf of Barrie City Council to this incredible event. But most of all, I want to give congratulations to Georgia College and its staff, the organizers of this MIS as part of the RISE series for the role that you are playing to further that culture of innovation in our community. It's alive and well in this institution and with it now happening online, we're going to continue to grow our efforts together between government, between the education sector, and of course, in support of you, the manufacturing sector. So welcome to MIS and I wish you the very best for this summit. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Those are really great remarks. It made us all think about the future and it makes me think about how the future is actually going to be quite positive. And there's something else that got reminded of while that was happening. And I wrote myself a little note because this happens all the time. This one says, <laughs> embrace awkward silence. <laughs> and then here's my other note. You can laugh. <laughs> so Thank you for those remarks. I'm going to move on and uh, introduce Dr. Mira Ray. She's going to be speaking about Georgian's Applied Research Program and RISE this week. Dr. Mira Ray is the Director of Research Innovation at Georgian College, and she is an experienced researcher, program manager, and a seasoned management consultant. Prior to joining Georgian, Dr. Ray worked with McKinsey as part of their operations and organizational design practices. She has extensive experience in both manufacturing and service operations. 
Here at Georgian, she manages our growing research and innovation team of staff, faculty, research students, all engaged in applied research projects with over 100 industry community partners. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ray leads up our competitive smart manufacturing program, which is funded by NSERC and many uh, industry partners and all our research projects that are linked to the Electra Center for Research, Innovation and Commercialization. So welcome, Mira. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm so excited to be here and I'm so excited about RISE this year. As you know, or some of you would know, last year we had our event canceled. It was scheduled for April 7th and in the 11th hour because of the newly emerging COVID-19 pandemic at the time, we made the decision to cancel the in-person event. But we are resilient and faced with the ongoing situation, we decided to forge onward and bring you a remote event that embodies the spirit of sharing, collaboration, and celebration of research, innovation, scholarship, and entrepreneurship that we aspire for at Georgia College. That is to say, we have chosen to rise today for tomorrow. As I mentioned, this showcase is taking place over a four-day event. So while Manufacturing Innovation Summit is this morning, this event is actually three conferences in one. We're here for the MIS. Just after this, we'll dovetail into the Research, Innovation, Scholarship, and Entrepreneurship Showcase. And in the afternoon, there is going to be the student-led Big Data Insights Conference running from about 1 to 5 p.m. During this four-day event, there will be live sessions every day from about 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And these sessions will engage, inspire, and make you think critically. Today's RISE Showcase session, which follows the Manufacturing Innovation Summit, has a special focus on digital transformation and business innovation, as well as equity, diversity, and inclusion in the workplace. As I mentioned, there'll be the Big Data Insights Conference this is a student-led, student-organized session with guest speakers, student projects, presentations, and roundtable discussions, all related to the application of big data analytics. This year, the theme for the Big Data Insights Conference is ransomware. With big data comes big responsibilities. Day two of RISE, that's tomorrow, we have a focus on entrepreneurship. You'll even be able to do some shopping at the 3D Click and Shop Marketplace. Day three, Thursday, the theme is related to health and wellness and social innovation, which is so relevant in this era of COVID-19. On the final day of RISE, which is Friday, we will focus on the foundations for student success. In addition to all these live events, I encourage you to explore the showcase sessions that are also being featured on this platform. It's data content that will be available on the platform all four days of the event for you to explore at your convenience. There are actually three different showcases. The Research and Innovation Showcase features R&D projects that we are doing with local industry partners. You can see how we're drawing on our expertise at the college to carry out valuable R&D projects related to product development, process improvement, and more. As our students and new graduates are integral parts of the team, they have the opportunity to apply their classroom learning to these projects. And you'll be able to see that during these showcase sessions. The second showcase session is the Research and Scholarship Showcase. And this features presentations by our staff and faculty. Here you can learn about a range of topics, including the Internet of Things applications, strategies for food security, GIS applications, sustainability research, health and wellness, student success, and Canadian history. Finally, the Innovate Student Showcase is where you can see some of the projects that our students are working on as part of their academic programming, from environmental technology, to big data analytics, to interior design, and more. So hopefully you'll explore all the content out there, learn from the Manufacturing Innovation Summit, learn about what the college is doing, and most importantly, enjoy these four days. Thank you, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Kurtam. I'm a senior account manager with BDC here in Barrie. I want to start off by thanking everyone for joining us today. And of course, a big thank you to Georgian College and the city of Barrie for your partnership. And so for those of you that don't know, BDC is the Bank of Entrepreneurs, and we work with over 60,000 business owners across the country in varying sectors and all stages of growth. In March 2020, we were among the first organizations to offer access to capital for business owners impacted by the pandemic. So this included 40,000 principal postponements to our existing clients, flexible working capital loans to small and medium-sized businesses, and several tools deployed by our advisory services team to support entrepreneurs. Today, we have our chief economist, Pierre Clarou here to share his economic outlook and the road ahead for manufacturers. Pierre leads a team of experts who analyze economic data to identify business and sector trends that impact us all. He's also responsible for providing economic analysis and advice to the bank's senior management team and supervises all marketing and industry research activities. He's held several influential positions as an economist over the last 25 years and has had a direct impact on entrepreneurs in Canada and overseas. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you 
our Vice President of Research and Chief Economist at BDC, Pierre Clarou. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. This has two parts. First, I'm going to talk about where we are in terms of the recovery. And the second part is about what should we expect for 2021. So let's start where we are. If we look at the world economy, we can see that China is the only major country around the world who had a positive growth in 2020. So China was the only country in 2020 to have positive growth. Every other major economies around the world had negative growth last year. The United States, Japan, Germany, Canada had negative growth of around 5%. Some developed economies had even worse situation like the United Kingdom, with a negative growth of around 10%. So as you can see, COVID-19 had a huge impact on the world economy. But the good news, we can see that the global industrial production after a major drop came back very quickly. Actually, this is a different recession than what we have experienced before. It's a self-imposed recession when government has to close part of the economy to protect their population against the virus and protect also the healthcare system. It's different from what we have experienced in 2008, 2009. We can see from the graph here that the global industrial production came back much quicker this time than it did in 2008, 2009. So this is an important thing to understand about this recession. We can see that this recession is different. The rebound is going to be much faster. I'm going to come back to that when I talk about what should we expect in 2021, but this is an important point compared to previous recessions. We can see that the volume of international trade is reacting exactly the same way. We're already higher today after only nine or 10 months than we were before the recession. Much better situation than what we have experienced in 2008, 2009. The United States now, as you know, this is our number one trade partner. We export 75% of our goods to the US in Ontario. It's actually 85% that export are going to the United States. So we're going to look at how the United States is doing. You can see that COVID-19 had a huge impact on the economy. In blue, you have the number of new cases per million in the United States, in red, you have Canada. The U.S. had much higher number of cases, and this really had to slow down the recovery in the United States. See, this is the level of job in the U.S. The U.S. economy lost 20 million jobs, and they have recuperated about half of it. As you can see from the graph, the recovery has been slow now, just because the number of cases in the U.S. has been so important. The situation should increase in the next few months as vaccination is getting very good in the U.S., we should have a better recovery in the next few months. Today, the manufacturing sector in the U.S., the production is at 96% the level of before the crisis. So the recovery has been pretty good, actually. We should go back to the pre-crisis level sometimes uh, this year. Some sectors have been performing better. Food manufacturing is already back to the pre-crisis level. And wood products, like lumber products, for example, production is now higher than what it was. A strong demand from the housing market has made the sector performing a bit better. The automotive sector after a strong decline, came back very quickly in last summer. And now it's around 96% the level of production. We're going to see that a bit later that in Canada, the situation is very similar. In the aerospace sector, it's taking a bit more time to rebound. As you know, we don't travel as much, so the demand for airplanes, parts, and maintenance is quite different. So this sector is going to take a bit more time to recover. So the situation has been slow to recover in the United States, but we are very optimistic in 2021 for two reasons. The first reason is the vaccination. When Mr. Biden was elected, he promised to vaccinate 100 million of Americans in the first 100 days. Actually, they are doing this in 60 days. So vaccination is going very well in the United States. They are vaccinating about 4 million Americans every week. So this is actually doing very well. The second reason why we are optimistic is the new government is introducing a program to stimulate the economy of $1,900 billion. This amount is so big that it's even hard to pronounce, but this is going to help the recovery in the United States. So we are very optimistic about the recovery <laughs> in 2021. We are not the only one to be optimistic. The level of confidence among American businesses is actually at an historic high. Businesses believe that as the vaccination is happening, 
the economy is going to recover very, very quickly. So we believe that the economy is going to grow by 5.5%. For the United States, 2021 is going to be the year of the recovery. Vaccination is going very well. And as the vaccination is going well, well, the Americans are able to reopen the economy and the recovery is going to be strong. We're going to move to Canada. We lost 3 million jobs in Canada, but the initial recovery has been quite strong during the last summer when we were able to reopen most sectors in the economy at the exception of hotels and restaurants. The economy came back very quickly. However, as you can see from the graph, the second wave of the virus has slowed down our recovery. For example, in January, we lost 200,000 jobs because Quebec and Ontario we impose some restriction on the economy. Unfortunately, the third wave that we are seeing right now is going to slow down the recovery in Canada. Uh, Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia are imposing new restrictions to phase the third wave, and this has slowed down our recovery. We can see that the recovery is quite different from one sector to another. Some sectors are already back to the pre-crisis level in terms of jobs. For example, financial services right at the top is at 103% the level of job of before the pandemic. So there's actually more people working in Canada in this sector than before the crisis. We are in total at 97%, which is quite good. But if you look at the bottom of the graph, you can see that some sectors are more affected, like accommodation and food services. These sectors are really affected by the restrictions imposed by different government. And they are only at 74% the level of job of before the, the crisis. So it's going to take some time before these sectors are recovering. It's going actually to take vaccination so governments are able to lift the restrictions on those sectors. The good news for Canada, we compare the recovery in Canada and in the United States. Actually, the recovery in Canada has been faster than in other developed economies. Here we compare with our neighbor, the United States. We are today at 97% the level of job that we have before the crisis, compared to 94% for the United States. So there's two reasons why we have been doing better. The first reason, we, we didn't have as many cases. We, we did a better job, actually, as a, as a nation to uh, control the number of cases in Canada compared to the, the U.S. or other developed economies. Also, our governments were able to introduce more programs to help Canadians. We can see that government transfer to Canadian has increased by 58%. So a lot of programs help Canadians and also Canadian businesses. As a result, our disposable income in Canada has increased by 7.7%. The disposable income is all revenues that Canadians are getting from salaries, from pension, from government program, for example. In this case, government program really help to boost our disposable income. As a result, Canadians has more money in their pocket today than before the pandemic. So this is actually a good news and it helped the Canadian economy to recover. And we can see that our retail sales came back very quickly because of these programs. So after a strong decline at the beginning of the pandemic, well, the retail sales came back during the summer at the level we had before the, the crisis. We can see the manufacturing sector is coming back very quickly in Canada. In red, you have the manufacturing sector compared to the overall economy in blue. So during the first part of the pandemic, there was a strong decline in manufacturing, but the initial recovery was quite strong. And today we're almost at 100% in terms of the level of economic activities, we are at 100% in terms of jobs. So the recovery has been quite strong in terms of the manufacturing sector. So the situation in Ontario is very close to the Canadian average. We are just a little bit below, and the reason is because of the number of cases, the Ontario government had to impose more restriction over the last few months, and that's the reason that the level of job is a little bit below. We can see that the recovery, just like for Canada, the recovery is quite different from one sector to another. Some sectors are performing well, for example, financial services, professional services, financial sector, they are way above the level of job they had before the crisis. Manufacturing is at 104%. So in total, the Ontario economy is at 96%. Just like in the rest of the country, some sectors are struggling. That's the case of accommodation and food services. This is a situation for the manufacturing sector in Ontario. 
the level of jobs is actually much higher today than before the crisis. There's about 30,000 more jobs in the manufacturing sector in Ontario today than a year ago, which is quite a good performance. See that it's quite different from one sector to another. In terms of uh, transport equipment, the uh, sales are still 15% below, but the food processing is doing quite well with an increase of 5%, and chemicals is doing quite well with an increase of 4%. The difference between the um, automotive sector, which is at 96%, just like in the US, and aerospace, that is 75%. So this is not going to surprise you. Aerospace is uh, struggling because people don't travel as much so the demand for airplanes and also for parts is much lower. It's going to take some time before this sector is going back to normal. We will have to have most people vaccinated, the borders open, and people will have to start to travel. So probably another year or so before we see this sector going back to the pre-crisis level. But the rest of the manufacturing sector in Ontario is performing well. The level of job is actually 30,000 more today than before the beginning of the crisis. One surprising sector, which is the housing market in Ontario. Housing starts increased by 16% last year in Ontario, which is quite remarkable. Home sales has increased significantly as well. This is a surprise for most economists, including myself, because usually when you have a recession, you have a slowdown in the housing market. People are waiting because of the uncertainty. Well, that didn't happen in 2020. You see the numbers, the housing market has been quite strong in Ontario, just like in the rest of the country as well, including in the United States. There's a few reasons for that. First, interest rates are very low, so it's definitely a good time to buy a house. Also, 40% of Canadians are working from home, so a lot of people are looking for bigger home or different home to work from home. So that's one of the reasons why the demand has been also strong. And the last reason is, like I said, 3 million Canadians lost their job. A lot of them has recuperated their job, but most of the people who lost their job, they are in the low income category, not necessarily people who are in the housing market. So people who are typically in the housing market with higher revenue were not really affected by the recession. That's probably explaining why the housing market has been performing well. So we expect the housing market to continue to do well in 2021 and probably in 2022. Because as construction is coming back, we believe that this is going to be a strong input on the economy. So, so far, the recovery is well on the way in Ontario and in Canada. But as you can see, some sectors are still struggling, mostly because they are facing restrictions imposed by governments because of COVID-19. So what should we expect for 2021? We are very optimistic. Our forecast is an increase of the economy by 5.2%, which is a strong increase. So this is could look pretty optimistic, but it's based on five factors that we believe is going to really stimulate the economy in 2021. So we believe that 2021 is going to be the year of the recovery for five reasons. The first one is the most important one, vaccination. Vaccination is beginning in Canada compared to other countries. For example, 37% of Americans have been vaccinated so far compared to 10% in Canada. The vaccination is accelerated in Canada. We're going to vaccinate 4 million Canadians just in the month of April. We believe that most Canadians are going to be vaccinated during the summer. So vaccination is key. If most Canadians are vaccinated during the summer, we will be able to lift most of the restrictions on our economy and the economy is going to be able to recover. What we learned in 2020 is when we lift the restriction on the sector, these sectors are coming back very quickly. Here I'm showing you the manufacturing sector in Canada. In red, you see the current situation. And in blue, you see the situation during the last recession in 2008, 2009. You can see the recovery this time. It's much faster than what it was during the last recession. So again, this recession is different. We didn't destroy wealth. We had to stop because of the virus. But as quickly as we can lift the restrictions on one sector, we can see that this sector is coming back quickly. So that's the first reason to be very optimistic. As vaccination is happening in Canada, we will be able to restart some sectors that have been affected by the restrictions we have imposed on them 
for the last few months. The second reason why we are optimistic is commodity prices that are important for Canada are performing very well. For example, in the yellow, you can see the price of lumber that has been increasing very significantly because the demand from the housing market in North America has been very strong. So this is helping many parts of our economy, including lumber manufacturing in different parts of the country. Third reason to be optimistic is on the government side. Government policy government programs has been really helping Canadians to go through this difficult period of time has helped the economy to recover. So these programs are still into effect and they are going to help the economy to recover in 2021. Interest rates are still very low, the lowest we have seen, and they are going to stay low for the next two years. So this is going to continue to help the recovery. The fourth reason why we are optimistic, and this time is coming from consumers. The graph that you see is showing you the saving that Canadians made in 2019, which was 18 billion, and the saving that Canadians made last year, which was well over $200 billion. So during every recession, consumers are saving more money because of the uncertain. But as you know, on top of it, we had so many restrictions on our economy that we couldn't travel, we couldn't go to restaurants or bars. So that was a, a good environment to save money, and Canadian did. They saved more than $200 billion last year. Some of this money is going to be spent this year when the economy reopened, and that's the fourth reason why we are optimistic about the recovery this year. Finally, on the business side, there's a lot of numbers here, but if you look at Canada in red, you can see the business investment intention that is coming back very quickly now. So we are almost back to the pre-crisis level. In blue, you see the result for the manufacturing sector. So the manufacturing sector is still at minus eight. That means that not as many manufacturers are going to invest this year than last year. But we're not back to the pre-crisis level. There's still a lot of uncertainty, but the situation is improving. So business investment in general in, in the economy is going to be higher, which is going to help the recovery of the economy. So five factors that we believe are going to support the recovery this year. But of course, there's a risk to this forecast. The risk that we believe is the most important, and it's COVID-19. We had a strong second wave in Canada. We are fighting against the third wave in different parts of the country. Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia has already introduced a number of restrictions. So we hope the third wave is not going to be very significant. And of course, vaccination is key. If most Canadians are vaccinated this summer, well, 2021 is going to be the year of the recovery. If we have a delay in vaccination, well, we're going to have a delay in the recovery of the economy as well. In conclusion, the recovery of the Canadian economy is well underway. Many sectors of our economy has been back to the pre-crisis level, but at the same time, it's not the case for every sector. Food, restaurants, accommodation, everything related to conference, events, and traveling. These sectors are still very affected by the virus and the restrictions we impose on the economy. But we are optimistic. If most Canadians are vaccinated this summer, we believe that most restrictions are going to be lifted and the economy will be able to fully recover. We still believe that 2021 is going to be the year of the recovery for the Canadian economy as well as for the U.S. economy. So we are expecting a strong growth for both the U.S. and the Canadian economy. So I'm going to stop here. And I think we have time for questions. If you have questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you, Pierre. That was so interesting. You know, just looking at all the stats that you put up there, I hadn't seen some of those. I need to go back and just look through them in a lot of detail so that I can better understand them. But I thought I would just start off with, in your opinion, what impact will the new Biden-Harris administration have on trade between Canada and the U.S.? Well, in terms of trade, we're not sure yet because Mr. Biden said that he's going to put some rules to reinforce the Buy America Act. So uh, this right. could have a negative impact on Canadian businesses, but we don't have the detail of these rules. Are Canadian businesses going to be exempted or not? So we're not sure exactly. So we're still waiting for that. But there's a good news in the election of Mr. Biden. He's going to spend a lot of money to help the U.S. economy to recover. And by rebound, Canadian businesses are going to benefit from that because because as the American economy recover, we're part of the value chain for many products and services. So this is going to help, in general, the Canadian economy. I see this new administration as positive for our businesses, 
but we still have to wait to see what are the detail in terms of a Buy America Act. Thank you for that. So I'm looking in the chat. Uh, how much of economic activity is related to real estate in Ontario or in Barrie? Well, for Ontario, it's about 10%. So it's a big number. Some provinces is even higher, like in British Columbia, it's almost 20%. In Canada and Ontario, it's about 10%. So it's an important sector of the economy because it includes construction. If your housing starts, mm -hmm. it's higher. But it does include a lot of services in terms of real estate. It has an impact on furniture. When you build more houses, well, you need more furniture, which is having a positive impact on that. So it's an important sector. And actually, in terms of the recovery this time, it's a big part of the recovery so far. Right now in Barrie, we're seeing real estate numbers kind of go through the roof. Housing sales are crazy. And we've got a lot of people coming out of Toronto moving to our area. What kind of impact do you think that's going to have overall? We're seeing that across the country. We did a number of research during the recession. Canadians are looking for something different because a lot of Canadians are working from home now. First, they're looking for bigger house. They don't mind the commuting as much because if you go to the office only once a week, well, you can commute a little bit more for that day. If the rest of the week, you enjoy better quality of life. So that's basically what people are doing when they're moving out of Toronto to go to Barrie, for example. Our research is showing that teleworking is just going to continue to be very strong. People want it. And when we ask entrepreneurs, well, they are much more open to that than a year ago. You know, there was not a lot of appetite before the pandemic on the business side for mm -hmm. teleworking. But today, teleworking is much more popular because a lot of people were forced to do it during the pandemic. All this, it's a, it's a phenomena that we believe that we're going to see a lot more people working outside the large city centers to enjoy life, to enjoy a better standard of living. They will be able to do it because they will be able to telework. Not everybody, of course. But a lot of Canadians will be able to do some work at home. Right. I think we've kind of proved this past year that there could be a new way of working and we can achieve, you know, just the same levels of our economy as we did before and perhaps, you know, even new things going forward. Definitely. A lot of businesses have invested in technology to allow their employees to work from home. Our research is showing that many entrepreneurs believe that productivity is the same. Employee motivation is higher. People are more happy to work more from home. But I think it's a model that is going to continue after this pandemic. Interesting. The government is pumping a lot of money into the economy. Are you concerned about national debt? Yes and no. The good news is we had a very good starting point. Before the pandemic, the Canadian debt to GDP was about 30%, which was by far the lowest level among the developed economies like the US, Germany, France, and Japan. A year later, this ratio is now 50%. Still the lowest, but now with Germany. So we, we close the gap, if I can say so. So that's the good news. We had a very good starting point. The last 12 months has been very expensive, so we could afford it. I think that was the right thing to do. Now we should think about rebalancing our budget to prepare for the next recession, to be able to help Canadians when we'll have a next recession. We don't expect to have one soon, but we know from experience that we will have another recession in the future. So now that we spend a lot of money to go through this recession, we should really have a plan to rebalance rebalance our budget to be ready for the next slowdown in the economy. Will increase in real estate prices impact the costs of manufacturing in our region? I don't think so, because the only impact is on the lumber production. The price of lumber has increased significantly in Canada just because the demand has been so strong. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of manufacturing, I don't think it will have an impact. That's good news. It's really interesting to see in your data that shows that some of these sectors are actually above 100% recovery and others are back to 97% or so. That makes me wonder if there's other factors at play. I know you have your five reasons why the recovery is going to happen. But if we're seeing things go over 100%, is that just demand in the market? Or is there another underlying cause happening here? Is it a new economy that's emerging? I think it's a little bit of both. The demand in the market has been strong for some part of the economy. For example, you have in your region a barbecue manufacturers that have really benefited from people not traveling as much. People decided to buy mm -hmm. more products for their home. So if you're making barbecue, what well, you will benefit from from that. We see a strong demand for some products. Everything related to home, everything related to electronics has been performing very well. Food processing has been performing very well as 
people are buying more for their home because they don't mm -hmm. travel. Some products has been benefiting from the pandemic, but that's not the case for everybody. So everything related to personal services because of the restrictions, they have been struggling over the last uh, few months. Same thing for restaurants, accommodation, everything related to tourism. It's going to take some time before we go back to a new normal. For now, there's some sectors who are benefiting from it. Some sectors are struggling. It's going to rebalance probably uh, by the end of the year. Interesting. So I've got a really interesting question here in the chat. It says, our economy has a lot of just-in-time inventory where we source parts from around the world. Essentially, we're decentralized. With COVID, we experienced supply chain issues. Do you foresee a more centralized production, like localized production in Canada? That's a very good question. Uh, we were really looking at this at the beginning of the pandemic because this person is perfectly right. With just on time, there was not a lot of inventory when this crisis happened. And we had a shortage of products in many sectors of our economy. But a year later, when we look at the data, we don't see what we call reshoring. So production that instead of being sent to Asia, for example, they will be done in Canada now. We don't see a big difference. Actually, it seems that the situation just went back to the pre-crisis level. What we used to buy outside the country, we continue to do so. There's not much of local production. And probably the reason is people are still very sensitive about price and when manufacturers are outsourcing a part to be done outside Canada, it's because it's an advantage in terms of the cost. To answer to the question of this person, unfortunately, the pandemic hasn't changed value chain. We just went back to the pre-crisis situation. I see. So then where do you see commodity prices such as aluminum going over the next year? It will continue to be good for 2021, but it should go back to normal in 2022 uh, when the situation around the world is coming back to normal. For example, the lumber is really expensive. It should be expensive this year as well. But as the situation normalized in 2022, the price of lumber should be back to the pre-crisis level, kind of a historic average. As you know, the restaurant sector is struggling at the moment. It's been shifting because of various lockdowns. What's going to happen in the coming year? In the region in the country where restaurants are reopened, they just went back to the pre-crisis level very quickly. We were surprised to mm -hmm. see how quickly they just go back to normal. So this is a very different recession than what we have experienced in the past. For example, in 2008, 2009, a lot of people mm -hmm. lost their job. So when the recession was over, it took months before we went back to normal. This time around, the recovery is much faster. So in some part of the country, like for example, in New Brunswick, where restaurants have been reopened for a while, where the situation just went back to normal very quickly. So that's what we expect for Ontario. When the restrictions are going to be lifted, we believe that the hotels, restaurants are going to come back very quickly. I wonder too, because under lockdown, a lot of the restaurants in the hotel industry had to rethink the way that they were operating and try to come up with new revenue streams. And I'm wondering whether they'll bounce back even stronger once we're ready to go back to normal because they have other ways to make revenue and working online and such. What are your thoughts about that? Will be interesting because you're right. A lot of restaurants, for example, they have been focusing on delivery and pickup and they have to change their menu to adapt to that. So we might have a mix of both when everything is reopened. I think the demand like for... Uh, going to restaurants is going to be strong. I show the numbers. Canadians have a lot of savings. I don't know for you, but for me, for sure, I'm looking forward to go to a restaurant with friends and to be able to do that. So when most Canadians are vaccinated and we're able to do that, we believe that the demand is going to be quite strong. Yeah, I would think so. I have a restaurant or a cafe on the side and we've seen past year be pretty rocky. The recovery is quickly happening as well. I wanted to ask you about the tourism sector. Our area here in Barrie, the edge of cottage country, and in the summer, this is a bustling tourist location. It's not just this area, but across Canada, we have a very large tourism sector. Given 2021, we won't be back to full recovery or full vaccination. What's that going to look like? Well, we believe it's going to happen in two stages. The right. first one is next summer, tourism should be good because I think the level of the restrictions is going to be lifted inside the country. So I think more Canadians are going to travel inside Canada and the season should be relatively good. 
I think we'll have to wait until 2022 before the border is open and we have more international tourism, which is very important for Canada. It's an important part of our tourist industry. I don't think we'll see that this summer. We'll have to wait until 2022 before this is happening. So first stage will be this summer with Canadians. Second stage will be probably next year when we fully reopen our border. Wow. At Georgian, we have some events management students. And one of the things that they're working on as a project is the way that we can do tourism through virtual means. And you know, I've got my VR headset here, which I showed this morning. And we're wondering, it came up in a question in another talk about could virtual reality tourism take off in Canada because people just want to see these amazing places? I think it would. I think this is an amazing technology and it's fascinating how you can really improve your experience by having that. But I think tourism is going to come back as well. I think uh, people, what we saw in the past, the first year after a recession, there's a strong demand. People are just waiting to travel. This time around, it's going to take a bit more time because of vaccination. But most Canadians should be vaccinated this summer. In the developed economies, it should be similar. So 2022, we should probably be close to normal. And I think people will start international traveling much more. Well, that would be good news for sure. Right. One last question. The idea of the vaccine that we're all waiting for to get that done, do you think that's going to put COVID behind us? We can just kind of get back to normal? That's a very tough question. I'm not a health expert. There's a lot of variant. I think the way we see it in terms of the economy, by the end of the summer in Canada, we should be really in good shape. Most restrictions should be lifted. So we should be really going back to our life if it's not by the end of this year in 2022. But we are confident that the vaccination is going to make a huge difference. We already see it in the U.S. where 40% of Americans are vaccinated. We can see that restrictions are lifted. The economy is really increasing. They created almost a million jobs just last month. So we expect to see the same in Canada. So let's end on that good note, because I think that's a strong way to end. Pierre, I just want to thank you so much for your talk today. I know a lot of us are going to be thinking about your stats and a lot of the points that you brought up. And we leave with a positive outlook that 2021 is going to look a lot better than 2020. Thank you very much for being with us today. And thanks to BDC for being our presenting sponsor. Thank you, everybody. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Once again, thanks to BDC. We couldn't have done this without you. Your support is great for getting the word out about the Canadian economy. And thanks again to Pierre for those incredible remarks that we had. And during the question period, thank you everybody for submitting your questions. I want to remind you about the RISE event, which starts shortly. Please find some time to tune into the sessions this week. There's over 80 speakers and many opportunities to connect with innovators and entrepreneurs. This event, is gamified. So if you're one of those competitive people, I'm going to tell you a secret word right now. You can get 200 points by using my secret game code, which is wizard. And that's the secret code for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Those of you who know our other business that I've got. Thank you, everybody, and have an absolutely wonderful day. Go through the feed loop platform and scan through some of the sessions. And then we will see you shortly when Rise begins. Mm -hmm.